This video was only made possible through the very generous contributions of my patrons. Thank you. It is useful, I found, to view them as courteous and highly abstract ISTPs. Both types are mechanics and puzzle solvers seeking to rationally model the outside world for themselves, but where the ISTP is focused on the sensation of their environment and its problems, the INFJ represses this in favor of communion and conversation with people and their problems. Both types are also audacious observers and profilers, that is, both feel privy to flashes of insight into the nature of the world, other people's character, etc. These insights are very matter-of-fact, and while the ISTP is far more willing to share them despite the feeling consequences, the INFJ will very much censor themselves for the sake of others. They are remarkably sensitive to the implications of their experiences. Metaphorically, they have highly sensitive spiritual skin. As a natural result of this, they feel the need to protect the skin with various layers of armor, as well as clever strategies of escape and withdrawal from emotional threats. It's almost like a peculiar kind of RPG character that has very low health, but a continual regeneration of it. So whenever things get too hot in battle, they have to duck and cover for a while to rebuild their strength. As a result, there is a definite sense with INFJs that you can never truly meet them. This is not so much because they are somehow infinitely complex, but because they are so remarkably private and reserved, and their primary defense is to withdraw, not unlike a wolf spider escaping a predator by retreating further and further into the labyrinthian crags of its lair. And should they actually be caught and kept from retreating? Um, well, have you ever been bit by a wolf spider? Thus, the warmth of an INFJ is not unlike that of a genuinely caring and gracious host, very willing to let just about anyone into their house, but depending on the person, is very particular about which rooms they may enter and enjoy, and which are kept forbidden to them, as well as how long they may stay in the house at all. But they do everything in their power otherwise, out of a genuine sense of duty to mankind, to make their guest stay as comfortable and refreshing as possible. This cannot shake the aura of mystery, however. The INFJ can come off as a mystic, sage, seer, or some other supernatural figure because their process is obscured by closed doors. The INFJ does not want others seeing their raw, matter-of-fact observations until they are translated for people. In some sense, they don't want you to see their house until they've had some time to clean everything up for you. In this sense, they are theatrical. They are there for you to host and address you. Very, very rarely is it the other way around. The INFJ's world is one of philosophical insights which they seek to encapsulate and articulate in rational TI systems. But as they also want to respect others' feelings, this generates a very sharp contrast between uh, the shallow courtesies of small talk and disarmingly intense and deep exploration of subjects. There is a little to no gradation between the shallow and deep ends of the pool for them, between asking name and major, and then, as soon as they feel a little bit more comfortable, trying to give birth to an excruciatingly difficult but penetrating insight. The image, overall, they are rather like a mysteriously wealthy newcomer to town. Courteous, charming, generous with their money, but almost off-puttingly silent about their own personal life or where their wealth came from, and investigations from the curious members of the town only reveal more and more layers to the fellow's story. In short, almost like a kind of Great Gatsby, if you've ever read that novel, except far more grounded and by no means on a course for disaster like he was in that book. In the INTJ video, I contrasted NI with SI. Both are introverted perception functions, and are therefore comparable, metaphorically, to pools of water into which pebbles and objects are thrown, creating ripples over the whole surface of the perceiver's mind. 
But whereas SI is aware of the ripples themselves, NI skips over this in favor of conjectures concerning the causes and implications of the event of the object's fall. Or to be clearer about it, SI concerns what actually is happening, whereas NI is always trying to find the obscured meaning or significance of what is happening. This is mechanically how NI always operates, and I believe that all the traits applied to NI and NI dominant types flow naturally from it, from the subjective perception of what we could call secret causes and their implications. The NI dominant's visionary attitude comes from their grasp of underlying implications of things, and their reputation for easily grasping very complex concepts is merely them grasping hidden underlying causes. They watch the motions of causes and implications that are hidden beneath the surface appearance of events. However, the INTJ's introverted realm is one of intuition and feeling, therefore, they deal with their NI insights by reconciling them with their personal value system. They thus become a matter of tone, feeling, joy, anger, wonderfulness, and all other aspects of value. The INTJ, therefore, comes to have very deep desires, or sometimes perhaps fears, regarding their insights. Deep feelings naturally motivate strong, forward action to bring things to pass or to prevent them. But the INFJ's introverted realm is of intuition and thinking. Therefore, they are instead reconciling their intuitive insights with a valueless, logical, rational system, with a purely knowledge-oriented blueprint of the universe. Feeling only enters into the picture when the INFJ considers the implications of their ideas for others and their well-being. They are thus motivated instead to understand the universe in a rather ISTP way, and then to impart that knowledge to others in a way that will benefit them. The INTJ, however, starts with the evaluation of the vision, deciding for and of themselves whether it's good or bad, and blueprints don't come into the picture until the INTJ begins bringing the vision about. The INTJ, then, is much more of a visionary in the regular sense of the word. The INFJ, on the other hand, takes on the relatively more passive, contemplative, wisdom-imparting role of a wise man. If there's anything that the INFJ personality lives for, it is to positively impact others through their hard-earned wisdom and understanding, more specifically to enlighten others, like a wise man. The INFJ perceives, through NI, a secret cause or implication, which almost always has something to do with the well-being of other people. The INFJ then articulates or formulates this for themselves via TI in order for them to better understand it, and more importantly so that they can then clearly communicate it, for the INFJ is driven by FE to help steer people away from danger, away from something those people don't seem to be able to see for themselves. Thus the INFJ very often takes on the role of a concerned observer, who seeks to help uplift and edify others with their knowledge, even to help them see the world from the INFJ's far-reaching eyes, in a word, to enlighten. The INFJ and the INTJ, as NI-dominant types, are both dominantly perceiving types, seeking before all else to take an information from the environment without rendering a judgment upon it. They are thus very image-based, and often have very strong imaginations in this visual sense. Thus, again, they seek to open people's eyes to the things they themselves see, especially the INFJ. They want to shine light on an issue, and often don't think to add any meaningful judgment upon it, at least not yet. Their first concern is to get a clear view of the thing and how it works. This can be confusing to say the INFP, because while everything the INFJ says is quite interesting to them, none of it seems particularly meaningful to the INFP because of how detached and impartial the INFJ always strives to be towards things. But the INFJ feels that a judgment of this kind would conceal or obscure aspects of the full thing from view. The INFJ, in a word, is striving to see everything for what it is. It is common for both the INFJ and the INTJ to often feel as though everyone around them just does not see as far or as much as they do. Other people don't seem to really actually think. 
but always stop short of the fullest vision of a thing. That is, they stop short of discovering its actual causes and implications apart from what is just on the surface, from what's merely apparent. The INTJ often finds this a frustrating roadblock to the accomplishment of their vision, whereas the INFJ often feels that the enlightenment of people is itself the goal. Either way, it is not uncommon for these types to feel very alienated from other people, even from other NI dominant types, who do not see what they see so clearly and distinctly. This in turn can drive, sometimes anyway, the NI type, especially the INFJ, I've seen it more with INFJs, to become, for lack of a better word, occasionally spiteful, in the sense that they delight in ideas that completely turn the tables on what is generally accepted or established, and actually relish the reaction of horror or confusion on people's faces when they are faced with the INFJ's truth. In this section, I'd like to make important distinction between the INFP and the INFJ. The comparison will shed light on aspects of the INFJ personality that couldn't be seen as clearly otherwise. The FETI type, in this case the INFJ, seeks to be objective in the more traditional sense of the word by providing a personally formulated rational justification, TI, for everything that they do. They do not regard personal feelings, uh, personally arisen feelings, as justifications in and of themselves, but only trust feelings that appear to them essentially impersonal, which is a paradox, of course, for the feelings are still personal insofar as feelings are, by definition, personal, but they are impersonal insofar as they are, quite frankly, artificially generated, I don't know how else to put that, but they're created for the sake of what the INFJ determines to be indisputably rationally right. The philosophical epitome of this is Kant's notion of duty and the goodwill, where he claims that truly ethical action must not be done out of any personal and therefore ungrounded inclination, i.e. because you want to do it, but is only truly ethical insofar as it is done first and foremost because it is the truly rational thing to do, i.e. because you've discovered that you must do it, regardless of how you feel about the matter. Kant later adds that if you also happen to want to do it, all the better, but it is primitive and ignoble for that to be the primary reason. I expect that this is all very abhorrent to the TEFI type, especially the INFP, because for them the most objective way to go about things is to wholeheartedly trust and actually work with one's personal feelings, helping them flourish as they were meant to. Reason is conversely treated as impersonal insofar as it has nothing to do with the individual or their interests, it simply is. This view finds its epitome in Kierkegaard, who claims the exact opposite of Kant. For Kierkegaard, truly ethical action is that which is done precisely because you truly do want to do it, and never because some facticity makes it necessary. The INFP cannot fathom how one could find direction by imposing personal logics on oneself. How could someone find their way without consulting their heart, what they really want? Meanwhile, to the INFJ, putting such trust in one's naturally arising personal inclinations is like receiving advanced business advice from a two-year-old. That is, how could one find their way by only consulting their heart and not their reason? This is why the INFJ can find the INFP or other FI-preferring types to be irritatingly selfish or self-centered, while the INFP finds the INFJ sometimes to be irritatingly insincere and ultimately untrustworthy and unpredictable. The INFP wants to reach the feeling core of the INFJ because that's what they're most comfortable working with. Then they would know how the INFJ emotionally ticks. But the INFJ refuses to let anyone see this core because who they are is not this primordial core, but how they choose to manifest it at any given point for the sake of others. In a sense, the INFP wants to see the platonic form of the INFJ's feeling, 
But the INFJ insists that the mere appearances of their feeling are what really matter. The INFP wants the INFJ to reveal how they do their magic tricks, but the INFJ sees that as defeating the point of a magic trick, to entertain and delight the audience. In this way, the INFJ cares about what they actually do, about the effects of their actions, while the INFP is more concerned about the intentions and the purity behind their actions. And this is the nature, I think, of these two types' different approaches to perfectionism and self-criticism. This leads into the last point I'd like to make in this section, concerning empathy. The INFP seeks to empathize by modeling the feelings of another person for themselves. They are actually trying to feel and value as the other person feels and values. The INFJ, however, sympathizes by modeling via TI not how the person is actually feeling, but the circumstances or necessities that they perceive via NI would generate the other person's feelings and then apply those circumstances to themselves. The idea here, here is that the INFP is built to understand intimately what another person actually feels, while the INFJ is built to understand deeply and intricately why another person feels that way. And in this sense, the INFP personality is more naturally or definitionally empathic, acting more like a personal therapist, while the INFJ personality is more removed and acts more like a personal psychologist or diagnostician. But both still feel very deeply for other people. It's just that the INFJ's method is to dispassionately understand people, the INFJ's passion generally comes into play as a sense of injustice against those who created such horrible circumstances for the sufferer, and a desire for things to be set right by their TI system. As I stated earlier in the video, the INFJ is very similar to the ISTP in that both are observers, making audacious conjectures about their environment, especially about the people in their environment. Both are puzzle solvers, seeking to figure out the best abstract model to represent an object or an event to themselves and thus understand it. Both approach what is given to them head-on, using NI insights to build a TI model of what is really going on at every step of the process. The INFJ makes use of these insights in order to understand other people. A common INFJ idea is, don't get angry, but seek instead to understand. Generally, people are all for this idea. They think it's great. Until, of course, the INFJ begins seeking to understand rapists and child molesters for the sake of knowledge. And should they present their sympathetic findings, as always in their comforting FE fashion, the contrast between these two things, the FE and the, and the TI honesty, uh, the contrast can be rather disturbing. Sometimes the INFJ does get angry or irritated, and here they can become rather the opposite of the detached psychologist. It would be a serious mistake to consider the INFJ as altogether dispassionate. They only come off that way because they are following a personal TI sense of duty or set of principles that they will not break no matter what they feel or fancy at a particular moment. As a rule, the strongest of these principles are their obligations towards others' welfare. And when these principles are violated in their eyes, it is remarkably easy for the INFJ to set all empathy for the trespasser aside. Some INFJs may even dream of the day that they can show everyone that they are not, in, that they are not an FE pushover, but internally a willing, remorseless monster for the sake of the suffering and oppressed. One can find this passion and emotional violence almost to varying degrees in Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, Dante's Inferno, throughout the writings and lectures of Sam Harris, and the political commentaries of Noam Chomsky, as well as Hitler's Mein Kampf, and pretty much everything Osama bin Laden never said about the United States. A great deal has been said about inferior SE, and in order to avoid beating dead horses, I will elaborate really just on one major point that I have not seen elsewhere, namely that the INFJ is ultimately seeking a kind of SE rest in pure actualization. 
That is to say, if we apply my motivation method theory from the past few videos about the inferior function, then the INFJ is using NI abstract perception, which always looks at what things really are beneath the surface, in order to gain better SE concrete perception. For example, Wittgenstein's philosophy is the use of NINTI analysis in order to set everything back to where it was, as it simply appears unquestioned, unarticulated, and fully enjoyed. Similarly, Schopenhauer cites direct sense experience as the most certain source of information due to its concreteness, and all concepts as immaterial scaffolding to better understand what is concrete. Plato justifies his metaphysical gazing by declaring the forms have greater reality and SE-styled vividness than their pale shadows here on Earth. Spinoza uses the notion of infinite substance to show how God is really just the totality of states of affairs as they are, i.e. nature, and he thus becomes, despite his spiritual language, a straight materialist. Thus, the INFJ is seeking concreteness and actualization of their NI ideas. This is their ultimate goal, it's pure reality, whether they realize it or not. There is a sense both to INFJs and INTJs of wanting to scour the whole, the whole entirety of existence and experience in the most raw and real way. For INFJs, this is often a method of shocking people by suddenly illustrating something with unprecedented graphicness. Perhaps the best example of this is Dostoevsky, who described brutal murder and depravity in his stories with solemn but unflinching honesty. Another would be Dante, who gave the scenes of hell an unsettling realism and rawness. Dear viewer, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you would like to view more content like this in the future, please check out my patron page, linked here. Donations make it possible for me to continue producing content regularly and with greater care, and they also come with rewards and bonuses listed on the page. Either way, it really does mean the world to me. Thank you so much for watching, and I wish you the best.